I work on a thing called the Smart and Maritime Conservation Program. That's not an NGO, it's just a work program. So my employer is the Swiss-based Paninko Foundation. And most of the staff we have in Indonesia work for a thing called Yayasan Ecosystem Lestari, which is effectively Paninko Indonesia. So who is this Ian Singleton guy? Well, you've heard a little bit from Richard, but I'm basically a former zookeeper. I started at Jersey Zoo in the Channel Islands with Gerald Dowell back in 1989 uh, on orangutans. And then I would take my vacations to go over to Indonesia, try and learn more about the, the species in the wild. I'd like to dedicate this talk to an orangutan called Gina, who died a couple of years ago, age over 50. But she's an animal that taught me a lot about orangutans, but also a lot about myself. And I eventually left Jersey to go uh, to the swamp forests of Aceh, on the west coast of Aceh province in northern Sumatra. And there I studied orangutan ranging behavior. The idea was to try and follow orangutans when they left the study area and camp under the tree and see how far they went and why, and all that kind of stuff. So it's quite challenging uh, work. I got used to going like three, four, five days with no food, but always some cigarettes and some water. Um, <laughs> The main, it, it, these swamps, they really are swamps. I mean, they, they're always waterlogged. At the driest, they're about ankle or knee height. In the, in the wet season, they go over your head, but it's always waterlogged anaerobic conditions. So what's the Sumatran orangutan? Well, we all know they're great apes, but once you get down to it, there's not really much difference between the great apes, only sometimes English guys, humans wear glasses. <laughs> There are currently recognized two types of Sumatran orangutan, two species. Uh, obviously, Bornean orangutans on Borneo, Sumatrans on Sumatra. But one of the first things you look at if you want to tell the difference is the beard. And you see the Sumatrans here have these beautiful, golden, uh, lush beards. And the Borneans have these grotty little, not really much better than I can do, uh, beards where the, the facial hair is actually the same color as the body hair. So if you want to tell the difference, you can always look at that. But the easy way, the, the fail-safe way, is that if you see an orangutan, you think, oh, isn't it pretty, isn't it cute, isn't it good-looking, it's Sumatra. And if you see an orangutan and you go, then it's body, and you'll never go wrong. <coughs> there are many differences between orangutans on the two islands. The two islands themselves are very different. Uh, Borneo has few or no volcanoes. The soils are very ancient and leached out of nutrients. So forest productivity on Borneo is way quite low. Uh, on Sumatra, most of the soils were laid down brand new 74,000 years ago when Lake Toba, well not Lake, but Toba erupted and Toba was the biggest volcanic event ever known on planet Earth. So it had a major impact on soil fertility and everything. And because pro uh, food pro forest productivity in Sumatra is so much higher, we see most animals at much higher densities in Sumatra and the orangutans are at higher densities and because of that the, the, fr the fruit tree densities are higher, and so the fruit trees are closer together, so it becomes economically, eff uh, energetically efficient to take a few companions with you. So we find orangutans are much more sociable as well on the island of Sumatra. Now, because they're more sociable, it means that if somebody invents something, other orangutans are likely to see it, and cultural differences and uh, inventions will persist in the population. So when you get to the peat swamp forest on the west coast, you find the highest densities of orangutans in the world, and you find orangutans regularly making and using tools. Now, although they make and use tools regularly in zoos, nobody had ever seen that in the wild until we went to study orangutans in these peat swamp forests. But we also started to, once we found that, we started to look at culture, and we found orangutans in different populations on both islands of many cultural differences, uh, basically doing things in a particular way because that's what they've learned from their parents and their peers uh, for no other reason. But on Sumatra, they're also known to regularly catch and eat these guys. And it's quite weird to see an orangutan chewing on a bone with blood on its lips. Um, but they, they do crave animal protein, just like chimpanzees do. It's just that, unlike the chimpanzees who were able to catch and work together to catch primates, this is pretty much the only sort of decent, chunky mammal that they can catch. But that's never been seen on Borneo at all either. So not only are orangutans and Borneo a little bit uglier, they're also a little bit dimmer as well. <laughs> so what's the status in the wild? Well, if you come to Sumatra and you fly from the, way, from the east coast to the west coast, you go over this place, the Losa ecosystem, which is around 2.6 million hectares of largely still intact uh, primary forest. 
The problem for orangutans and tigers and elephants and rhinos is that a lot of it's too high and the fruit trees are just too far apart. Uh, so there's no rhinos, elephants, tigers and orangutans in this picture. But look at the terrain, because I'll come back to this. Just look at how steep and rugged and unforgiving this kind of terrain is. If you met, the reason these forests are still there is because people, people have learned that if you mess with them, there are serious consequences downstream, major, major consequences. Now, we did some surveys of orangutans between 2009 and 2012. I think we went to over 250 uh, line transects strategically placed around the forest. And this is probably the most complete uh, and rigorous survey of any entire great ape species distribution. And from that data, we know there are around 14,000 orangutans left on the island. They're a critically endangered species. 85% of them live in this thing called the Losa ecosystem, which is this purple boundary here. We talk about rainforest being the lungs of the world. Well, in Sumatra, they're actually shaped like a pair of lungs. And most of this Losa ecosystem is in the province of Aceh, which 10 years ago nobody would have heard of, but uh, ever since the tsunami in 2004, a lot of people are familiar with. Now, some people say, well, oh, Ian, there's 14,000 orangutans. You know what, what you're worried about? So I always remind them that Barcelona's football stadium seats 100,000 100, people. So all the Samaritan orangutans in the world would sit quite happily behind the seats, just at one end, behind one goal. So the next time you see Lionel Messi lining up a penalty, remember that that could be the entire global population of Samaritan orangutans sitting right there. But think then how easy it would be to get rid of them. You know, one disease outbreak could easily snuff those guys out completely. Now, there's a very interesting orangutan population down here, south. This is Lake Toba, which I mentioned before, the biggest volcanic eruption. So most of the orangutans are north of Lake Toba, but there is one small remnant population down here, which we, know, which we refer to as the Bacantoro population. And that's becoming quite interesting. We've done genetic studies of orangutans that have been confiscated from known areas of the forest. And we find that this one actually stands out quite separate from all the orangutans further north. And more than that, it seems to be genetically quite close to the orangutans in Borneo as well. So it's possible this could be the remains of the original ancestral wild orangutan population, but we're doing further research uh, to look into that. So what's the problem for orangutans in Sumatra? Well, there are several. The one we hear most about, and by far the most impactful in terms of hectares of habitat loss is the palm oil issue here. Yeah? Now this is monoculture palm oil, but it's not a little bit of palm oil here and a little bit of palm oil there. It's entire landscapes. You can drive through this stuff for hours and hours and hours and see almost nothing else. Now, they also don't necessarily chop it down in any systematic way. They chop it down piecemeal, and it's very easy to imagine how species get trapped and isolated in these little fragments. But even when it's a mature uh, palm oil plantation, there's really nothing much living there. You know, you're lucky to find a, a, bull, a bird or a mammal or a reptile. So you go from like a primary tropical rainforest with thousands if not millions of species per hectare to almost nothing. Why is this happening? Well, obviously because we keep buying this stuff. Even if you're trying to boycott palm oil, you've probably got some in your house because it's just so ubiquitous in the things we buy. It's in your foodstuffs, your crisps, your biscuits, your ready meals, microwave meals, whatever. It's in cosmetics, it's in shampoos and detergents. But this is what it looks like. It's basically like a miniature coconut. You get the palm oil from the yellow husky bit and you get palm kernel oil from the white meat in the middle. Now the problem for orangutans and everything else that lives in these forests is that to go from a plant, uh, forest to a plantation, you have to go through this stage. Now I used to say, every living creature, almost every living creature gets killed in this process. But it's more than that. It's mosses and lichens and fungi. Every living thing gets killed in this process. I went into this area here, which belongs to a company called Calista Ala, deliberately to look for signs of life. I couldn't find a lizard, I couldn't find a grasshopper, you find a few spiders because they get blown in on the wind and the odd termite here and, here and there. But that's why <coughs> everything else that was living in this area is now dead. And for the most part, that includes the orangutans. If they're lucky, they may be able to find their way into some forest nearby if there is any. But there, the forest is already probably overcrowded with orangutans. There's only so much food to go around. So they starve 
and they get malnourished and eventually they die of malnutrition. Or they come out and raid crops or whatever and they get shot or butchered for their, for their efforts. Now, some people say, well, oh, orangutans are coming out of the forest to steal uh, palm oil, to raid palm oil crops, to eat the seedlings or the fruits. Well, they no more eat palm oil than shipwrecked mariners will eat their shoes and their belts. It's not because they want to eat this stuff. It's a last-ditch effort of survival. This guy actually got petrol poured on him and was bent a while. So what are we doing about it, the SOCP? Well, we started in 2001, and the main goal at that time was to set up a brand new sort of rescue and rehabilitation program for orangutans, because there were still a lot of illegal pets, and there was nowhere for them to go in Sumatra at that time. But we started as like two people, a chair and a telephone, and we've now over 100 full-time field staff uh, scattered over 10 different locations. We have an office in the city of Medan. We have a quarantine center not too far away. We're now developing the Orangutan Haven project, which I'll mention. We have one, two, three uh, field research sites where we have students come, but we also have permanent assistants collecting data and observations on wild orangutan behavior and ecology. And we have two uh, reintroduction centers where we're establishing new populations of orangutans where they weren't before. And we have the Tripper and a few other sites where we're doing intensive habitat protection work. Now, as I mentioned, the first thing we, we wanted to do in 2001 was to set up a new rescue and rehabilitation program for these animals. Now, this is what they look like. They're often <coughs> chained up, sometimes 5, 10, even 15 years in the same spot, barely able to move like a meter away from the tree or whatever. Uh, they're usually in filthy conditions with very poor nutrition, uh, almost zero medical care. Or they're kept in little cages, sometimes barely bigger than their bodies. This one's a bit lucky. But people look at these pictures and they say, oh, the poor things, the poor little orangutans. But these are the lucky ones, yeah? All the poor things are dead. These are the lucky survivors of this process, this habitat destruction process. The very few, the one in a hundred or the one in two hundred that survive that process and have another chance at a life as a wild orangutan. And they're a byproduct. Nobody's going into rainforest to capture baby orangutans full of pet trade. There's, not, there's enough that are around, people know of, uh, to supply any demand as a byproduct of the forest loss. And they're effectively refugees from the, from the from forest that no longer exists. This is what a couple of them look like, chocolate. Uh, he stands out because he's the only little orangutan I've ever worked with that completely shunned all human contact. We drove him back from Aceh to the quarantine center, and he refused any attempt to give him some comfort and warmth, and insisted on just sitting on the vinyl on the back seat the entire way. He had just been passed around from one person to another, and teased and tormented so much, he didn't want anything to do with people anymore. Fortunately, he's now a wild orangutan in Janto again. This one, Binawana, also known as No Nose, because she has no nose. She has a machete scar all the way from the front, right to the back of her head because she was clinging onto her mother when she was hacked to pieces, basically, simple as that. But she's doing very well at the quarantine center as well. Now normally we don't see these orangutans that are killed in this process, we just see these infants that end up as pets in people's backyards. Now occasionally over the years we have been called out where people have battered orangutans, they've still been breathing, they've dragged them home to impress their friends, somebody's found out, but give, them, give us a call and we've sent the vets up. But usually they're a pretty hopeless case. To get an orangutan to a point where you can manhandle it, uh, you basically have to batter it almost unconscious. This poor girl, she died two hours later on the road uh, because she had a hole right through one side and out the other, probably from a sharpened bamboo spear. Right? You, could, you could actually see through from one side to another and she was still alive. This one here, you can see, is completely swollen. Her entire body is swollen like she's just done 100 rounds with Mike Tyson. Again, she survived about three weeks before she packed up. Uh, autopsy revealed massive internal hemorrhage and fractured skull in several places. It's amazing she survived so long. She also still birthed at the point of being beaten as well. But this guy, this is what surprised me. We were actually called out because somebody had captured this guy and stuck him in a village. Now, I meet a lot of zookeepers and vets, and I say to them, you know, could you capture an adult male orangutan in a tree take it 10 kilometers and tie it to another tree without the, without the use of anesthetic. And they, they think I'm an idiot, you know? It's just impossible. 
and yet Indonesians do it all the time. The, and I'm sat there thinking, how the hell do they do that? Yeah. Orangutans are, I mean, he probably weighs about 110, 115 kilograms. He's got the strength of 8, 9, 10 men, whatever number you like, but basically because he carries that weight on his biceps and his shoulders most of the day. Um, immensely powerful. He's got canine teeth as big as a lion, and he's got four hands. Trying to wrestle even a young orangutan that doesn't want you to win, and you won't win because it's like wrestling an octopus. You just can't get them off. <coughs> and yet, this guy has also got the strength of eight people. And I started thinking, how the hell would you do that? How, how could you catch an orangutan without an aesthetic? And then I was watching the news one night in Jakarta, and there was a clip that says, uh, villagers turn out as boy is bitten by crocodile. And it flipped, it flipped to the scene, and it was dark, and there was like about 3,000 people on the riverbank there. <clears throat> there was like headlamps and torches and car lights, and there was police and military, and they were mindlessly machine gunning a river. You know, it was absolutely insane. And I thought, that's how you do it, mass hysteria. Now, mass hysteria is when you get a bunch of people, and they, the amount of adrenaline pumping through their body just allows them to do superhuman things. <coughs> The, Incredi the Incredible Hulk was basically based on these stories of people who have a car crash and the wife is trapped under the front, and they pick the car up, you know, something that they could never do under normal conditions. Now, the only way you could ever overpower a guy like that is with this amazing uh, violence, you know, this level of violence is just hard to comprehend. Now, <coughs> Most of the orangutans that we receive at the quarantine centre are confiscating illegal pets. But ourselves and other partners in the region are also increasingly going out there to capture and rescue orangutans that are trapped in isolated fragments of forest. Now, it's not something we like doing. For me, it goes against my ethics to capture a wild orangutan in a tree. But we will do that sometimes when we know the orangutan is going to be dead in a few months if we don't get them out of there. This one I draw your attention to because this is actually in on the land owned by a company called Baroni. Now, Mr. Baroni is the Indonesian chairman of the Indonesian <coughs> Palm Oil Growers Association. So he's the national ambassador, you know, the face of the industry for Indonesia. And he's killing Americans just like everybody else. And none of them are not doing that. <coughs> like I said, we don't like to go and rescue these animals. It's risky. It's logistically very difficult. Sometimes the orangutan is seven kilometers away from the nearest road. The orangutan is heavy. The box it has to go in is heavy. Uh, it requires an awful lot of uh, planning and everything else and funding. Uh, and it's also risky. It's amazing how few, how little uh, injuries, how few injuries we get from these kind of rescues. But there's always a, a risk of serious injuries when these animals are coming down up the trees. However hard you try to catch them in a net. This is just a couple of pictures of orangutans that have been rescued like that. This guy, Angelo, here. Uh, this photo went viral, millions of likes and shares on the internet, um, because it looks like he's still awake, and he's actually not, he's an easy part. But sadly, this is a more typical case, uh, these animals being rescued because they're starving to death, and if you don't get them out there, they're gonna be dead. So once the orangutans come to the rescue center, what happens next? Well. We have all the facilities we need there. We have a proper, well-equipped medical facility. We've now received, since 2001, over 360 orangutans through the center. We have specialist facilities for very young infants that wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and, like Richard said, want to stick diapers full of crap on your face. Um, but they, when they wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and they need a drink, we have keepers living in there. They can hear them. They can deal with it. <coughs> And every orangutan that comes in has to spend a mandatory sort of, usually two months, uh, often three months, uh, quarantine period in which they're kept in these isolation cages so they have no physical contact with orangutans next door or anything like that. But once they get through that stage, once they've been fit, pronounced fit and well, they've gone through all the medical checks, they've passed the tests, they've, they've passed their quarantine, then they move on to these larger socialization cages at the back of the center. <coughs> and here, they're introduced to groups of similar aged orangutans, similar uh, stage orangutans. And often that's the first time they've met and had contact with another orangutan since their mother was killed and they were first captured. So it's already nice to get into that stage. You feel like you're achieving something when you get to that stage. But you also sometimes see these animals have a, a new little sparkle in their eyes and a new enthusiasm for life. 
Again, this is what some of them look like. Septian is now free in the forest. Sorogia is soon to join. They're a bit older now. <coughs> this is Yeni, the vet, who's currently training with the, the vet team at Chester Zoo. And as I said, every orangutan that comes in, we usually give them a few days to get used to the new surroundings, new diet, new people, and then we will anesthetize them and give them thorough medical checks. We, do, we give them IDs, uh, we give them a tattoo, uh, we put a transponder chip like you would your cat or your dog, we take photos of the dentition and the gum pigments, because they don't change much face, and we take uh, fingerprints. And we give them a thorough once-over medical check, looking for anything unusual. We always take chest x-rays to look for tuberculosis, and we take blood samples to test for hepatitis and various other things, and anything else that's required at the time. I'll just draw your attention to this little girl here, my pony. Now, myself and Azrael confiscated her in 2009 from a police officer. She was chained up. She was very skinny at the time. You can still see the scarf on the chain uh, around her neck there. But she came to us, and she did very well. And then she moved on to one of the reproduction centers. She was released. She did very well in the forest for a while. And then one day she fell out and broke her shoulder, fell out the tree. You can see the bone goes up here, and the ball that's supposed to be on the end of it is behind the bone, so it's completely severed. Uh, with the help of a Swiss surgeon, we managed to fix this up with a very fancy bit of kit. And she made a full recovery, and she was released again in Janto uh, a few months later. <coughs> I'll come back to her in a minute. This is just to give you a few ideas of the numbers. When we first started, the province of Aceh was in civil war. It was a separatist movement, a military zone. Plantations were not operating. They were all abandoned. And farmers were not farming the, forest at the, for, uh, the farms at the forest edge. So conflict with the orangutans was very low. Um, but we still managed to get quite a lot of these illegal pets out of there, from mostly maybe captured before the civil conflict. Then the tsunami hit, and everybody was busy doing other things for a couple of years, running around like headless chickens. And then, since then, the plantations come back to work, the farmers go back to the fields, and we've seen uh, an average of 25 to 30 a year since then. Now, the point of that is that people have been rescuing illegal pet orangutans and rehabilitating them in Indonesia since the early 70s. And the numbers that we're getting now are as bad or worse than they ever were. It hasn't made much difference. And this is despite all the documentaries on TV, and the magazine articles, and the newspaper items. The problem is as bad as ever. And one of the reasons is a complete lack of law enforcement. It's been illegal to capture, keep, kill, own, sell, transport an orangutan in Indonesia for decades. And yet no one was ever prosecuted for, for a long, long time. The first prosecution I know of was in Borneo in 2010 <coughs> to a couple of guys trying to sell two orangutans. And then we got the first one in 2012 with fines of $500 and eight months prison. We're now getting three or four cases a year, successful prosecutions a year. And the numbers are going up, the fines are going up slightly, and the prison terms are going up as well. <coughs> so we have started in the right direction, but it's very early stages. And we've also, all these prosecutions so far have been for selling orangutans. Nobody's yet been prosecuted for killing or owning an orangutan. So these are two issues that we really want to focus on in the coming years. Get the numbers of prosecutions up, and get people prosecuted also for killing and only in the orangutan. So once the orangutans have gone through the quarantine center, and they're pronounced fit and healthy, they've been socialized, they've been mixing with other orangutans, we can see who's dominant, who's subordinate, who's uh, smart and probably spent a lot of time with their mother before they were captured, and who's pretty dim still, and a bit like a bonnie in a orangutan. And then they're moved on in little groups of sort of friendly peers <coughs> to one of the two reintroduction centers. Now, it struck me about a year ago that we're actually probably unique. As far as I know, there's no other organization creating viable new wild populations of a great ape species. You might say, well, they're reintroducing orangutans in Borneo. Yeah, but there's, in Borneo, everywhere there's trees, and orangutan pops up now and again. So they're actually releasing orangutans into areas that have existing wild populations. But they're able to argue in some cases that, <clears throat> okay, the fruit, we've surveyed the fruit, and then we think this, the carrying capacity should be here, but the population is here, maybe from hunting 20 years ago or something. So we think we can squeeze another 20 in there, and another 15 over there, and another 12 over there. <clears throat> in Africa, there are people in the room who probably know more about that than me, but my experience is that the, the chimpanzee programs, they're spending like, 
eight years releasing 10 chimpanzees at a cost of several million dollars, and they have no idea if these animals survive or not. So they're not, you know, they're, they're basically trying to release for welfare reasons or to free up cage space so they can rescue more illegal pets. There is one organization releasing gorillas, but again, their motives are not necessarily conservation or to establish new populations, it's to solve a problem somewhere else. So our goal here is to set up two brand new, viable, self-sustaining wild populations of Sumatran orangutans in forests where historically they did occur. In the last several hundred years, they haven't occurred there. Um, and to do that, we need to release, we need, we need 250 surviving reproducing animals in each before we can sort of sit back and say, okay, if we stop releasing, this population should be viable for the long term. Now, to achieve that, we need to release around 350, at least, in each of those two areas. So we started back in 2003 in Jambi, down south, working with Frank Bert Zoological Society. We've now released over 170 down there, and we've, we get more babies every year, born to the females that we've reintroduced. And we started in 2011, releasing orangutans right in the far, far north, up here in Janto. And we've right now released 100 orangutans there. I love Janto, it's a beautiful spot. We still have elephants and tigers wandering around. We have nine otters that swim around in the river where you take the bath, so I love going up there. We have, this river is quite useful because people can normally wade across it, but the orangutans don't, so we don't have orangutans coming up to the camp trying to steal bananas like they do in other places. <laughs> but to, in order to find a, a forest that's safe and secure and you feel confident to release your animals, it's always going to be difficult to get to. If it was easy to reach, it wouldn't be there anymore. So we spend an awful lot of money uh, maintaining and repairing these specialist off-road vehicles. It's a big drain on the budget of Janto, but without that access to the site, we wouldn't be able to do anything. Now, believe it or not, that car is actually white. <laughs> that's the evidence. But not only do you need specialist vehicles, you need specialist drivers. And if you don't, and you let me have a go, this is what tends to happen. But we also have some other unexpected problems up there. We had this little python here, suddenly crawled out of the glove box one day, halfway home, and I've never seen a, a young female vet student from Randa Ache leave out of a car as fast as she did. And then this guy came and sort of sat down in front of the camp late one afternoon and decided he was going to have a snooze there. <coughs> now the funniest bit about this was that most of the guys who had been following orangutans that day, collecting data, had already come back to camp, so they were sitting having a coffee just watching this guy. But they knew that there were two guys that hadn't come home yet. And even though they had walkie-talkie contact, they decided they wouldn't tell them. <laughs> Great fun. These are just a few pictures of orangutans that we've released. This is Monkey, sitting up a tree there, stuffing her face on figs. This is uh, Mickey looking handsome, because he's smarter, of course. And this is a nice little picture of three of them up there in the trees. Now, my job is like most people's. It's pretty terrible most of the time. It's meetings and reports and having to go to the airport and go to a stupid government meeting and come back and deal with bureaucracy and staff issues and salary increases and all that kind of stuff. But I do still occasionally get out to the forest and I love to go into Janto and you do this off-road thing and you get there all sweaty and have a cup of coffee and you walk across the river and you wander around in the forest looking for orangutans and you hear the trees swaying and you look up and there's an orangutan staring down at you and it couldn't care less if you were there or not. And that's fantastic, because that's exactly what we're trying to achieve. Orangutans who are living in trees, behaving uh, like orangutans, interacting with other orangutans, and not interested in people wandering around down below. So it's a real thrill to get out there and see that, and you never stop to get a bus out of there. But I like this one as well, because it's especially rewarding when you remember sometimes how pitiful these animals were when you first met them. Like monkey here, had a chain around her neck with maggots coming out of it. She had fungus all over her arms, a big pot belly, skinny little, you know, really pitiful little animal. And yet there she is, behaving like a wild orangutan, up in the trees, potentially going to live 40, 50 years and have five kids, and be one of, she's one of the founders of a brand new wild population of a species. Now I've given this talk a few times in the US, and in Adelaide, in Australia, and in the US, they're so proud if they can trace their ancestors back to the people who came over on the Mayflower as the Pilgrim Fathers now. Oh, yeah, my family goes back to John Watson on the Mayflower. 
And then Australia, they love it when, when, when they can trace their family back to the settlers in Adelaide, because they were the first ones who went there voluntarily, and went next con. Um, and that's the thing about these animals, you know. In, in 20, 30 years, there's going to be little orangutans, or even big ones by then, uh, sitting in trees, sort of, sort of talking to each other, saying, oh, yeah, you know, I'm descended from monkey, you know, who, which line are you descended from? Oh, I'm from the Samayan line. So these really, the, the animals we are releasing here really are the founding fathers of a brand new wild population. And they, 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 all their descendants will be that wild population. Now, remember the little girl who I showed you with a scar on her neck who broke her shoulder and was released again? Well, we've been waiting for a baby to be born in Janto for ages. And just two weeks ago, she swam back into the area near the camp and carrying this guy here, massive. Now, as far as I know, he's the first orangutan born, conceived and born in the wild in Jantala for hundreds of years. And this is a really major event for us. We've been waiting for him. We hope he's going to be the first of many now. Because when we release orangutans, they're usually like six, seven, eight years old. And they don't normally have their ba first babies in the wild until they're like 15. So now we're starting to see some of those first releases actually becoming sexually mature and able to get pregnant and conceived. So we hope he's the first of many. But it's a major motivator for the staff too, because they've been working for sort of five years. You know, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? And all of a sudden they see this and think, ah, oh, there is a point to this work. <laughs> now, I'm in a university with smart people, and maybe there's a few techie people in here as well, but I just want to mention this in case anybody has friends or contacts or is themselves a techie wizard. We've always wanted to radio track orangutans after release. I mean, some of them sort of go off and hang around the area and we bump into them a lot. Some of them disappear for six months and then come back, so we see them now and again and we're able to check on them. And some of them just wander off. We have no idea where they go or where they survive. We do have teams going out now 10, 15 kilometers deep in the forest and setting up camps to look for these animals. But we've always wanted to be able to radio track them. Now, with chimpanzees and gorillas, you can put collars on them because they have they're so, their lives are so complex and, and more social that they have limited attention spans to deal with things like collars and destroying cages and things. Whereas orangutans really don't care much about what anybody else is doing, so they'll sit and persist until they solve the problem. And they also have very sensitive throat sacs, so we think that if we put collars on orangutans, they'll either destroy the collars or they'll damage themselves in the process of trying to, or they'll get some other issues. So nobody's ever been brave enough to put a collar on an orangutan. Now, two vets from Austria took up the challenge and they developed these little white chips. They're about as big as a coin. They go under the skin on the back of the neck. It's actually quite safe. Um, and they give you a radio signal about 300 meters for about two years. Now, two years is good enough for us to know if the animal's got a good chance of surviving or not. The problem is the casings that they're in keep breaking. So we are not actually using these chips right now. And I'm trying to get this technology or, or better into some casing that's medically more reliable. And I can't believe that in these 2017, we've got this technology and we've got children getting filled in so that last a lifetime. Why can't we get these people talking to each other and solve this problem? Because this is going to be a game changer. You know, we really do need to monitor these animals much better. And I think if we can get the chip solved, we're already pretty advanced with drone work over there. We can fly like. 100 kilometers now on the newest batteries on one flight. Um, so if we can get the chips talking to drones, we should be able to survey like 10,000 hectares at a time and figure out where Johnny is. And if we do that next week and we find Johnny's moved 15 kilometers, we know he's still alive. If we find out that Johnny every week is in exactly the same spot, we know he's probably not. But we, I feel like we're this close to solving this problem. And it's going to be such a massive game changer for orangutan reintroductions, but probably also many other species. So if you do know anybody who wants to take up the challenge, do let me know. Now I'm going to switch the topic of the conversation a bit and talk about habitat loss, the big issue. And I'm going to mention the trip of beach swamps, but also some other things that have struck me as odd in the recent years. Now, when I did my PhD, I did it in this Cluet Swamp here, a place called Suat Glindi. Suat Glindi. But when I was there in the late 90s, I knew that this particular swamp here was being destroyed. It was being handed out to palm oil companies and they were chopping it down and converting it. Now, remember, these peat swamps, they have the highest densities of orangutans in the world. Your average orangutan density in Borneo is like 0.8 to 1 per square kilometer. On the east side of Sumatra, it's about 1 to 1.5. In these peat swamps, it gets as high as 7 or 8 per square kilometer, so 10 times higher than Borneo. 
because of that, they spend more than 60% of their time with other adult orangutans and their kids, so they're much more sociable. They have this tool-use culture and everything else. So I always refer to these three beats once a year. It's like the orangutan capital of the world. Quite rightly so. Now, P is basically carbon. It's all the little twigs and branches and trees and dead insects and dead tigers and what have you that die and fall in the, in the swamp water, which is anaerobic, it, so the carbon doesn't react with oxygen and everything else. It just piles up, layer after layer, over thousands of years, sometimes as much as 10 meters deep. So huge amounts of carbon tied up in these. Indonesia has, Indonesia is, is the third biggest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world, after the US and China. The US and China, it's all from burning fossil fuels. In Indonesia, it's from burning forests and peatlands. And the amount of, you know, Indonesia also has 56% of all the world's tropical peatlands. And tied up in those tropical peatlands is 4 to 16 times the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere today. So my point here is that when we're trying to save these areas, it's no longer just about saving the orangutan or saving this or that species. This is a global issue. This affects every single one of us. This is about saving human habitat. So it's a global issue that everybody needs to be concerned about. Now, that issue, that prompted, that, the scale of the issue prompted the Norwegian government a few years ago to pledge one billion US dollars to Indonesia if it could come up with ways of reducing its emissions. And so they came up with a thing called a moratorium. I'll come back to it. Now, this is the trip of peat swamps uh, in 1990. It's 60,000 hectares, around 3,000 orangutans or so. And this is the situation pretty much now. We've just got this little patch of forest here, a couple of other little bits, uh, probably 150, 200 orangutans surviving in there. And the area is mostly capped up by palm oil plantations. But notice this little gap here. This is uh, an old uh, GIS. In, uh, Shape line. So, in a response to this billion dollar pledge from the, the Norwegians, Indonesia established a moratorium in May 2011. It said no more plantations will be granted in primary forests and peatlands. And then, lo and behold, the Aceh government granted this new concession in August 2011. And we thought, that's clearly illegal. Somebody needs to do something about it. Thought, well, who's going to do something about it? So we sat around in a room, a few little NGOs ourselves, you know, a few NGOs locally based in Aceh, and a group called Walhi uh, Aceh, which is kind of friends of the earth uh, in, the, in the different regions. And we decided that together we would sue the, sue the governor, and we would sue the company. We never thought we could win, but we thought it's just so blatant. Somebody has to do something. You can't just let these things happen and not, not kick up a fuss. So we did. We decided to uh, sue. And we started to collect all the evidence. And we found that the company was clearly clearing the forest and digging canals 10 months before they even had a permit. And we won this case. Now, one of the reasons we won this case was because we got massive media and international attention on it. Indonesia is so corrupt. If you file a lawsuit or a legal case against somebody, what happens generally is a big fat envelope comes under the table and the judge finds a, finds a way to throw the case out. But we got so much international attention on this case that you just simply couldn't do that without an, an outcry. And how we did that was we basically, once we filed the cases, we started, we got reporters and we got photographers in and we got film crews coming in. And we got, we got it Tripper into the international news for, on an almost weekly basis for like two or three years, in national newspapers pretty much daily for about two or three years. And one of the reasons was, just after we filed the lawsuit, all the other companies came back to work after the civil war and tsunami started burning, and we got images like these on BBC and CNN and everywhere else. And we got people out there liking and tweeting these things. Now, you sometimes wonder, why do I bother doing that? But you go to a major global newspaper now, and in their front office, they have a, a, like a digital screen there with all the articles, their main articles that day. And they're counting the number of tweets and shares and likes and everything else. And they base their decisions on what they're going to write about on those kind of things, their, their global interest. So if they, if they print an article and they think it's going to be really popular, but it doesn't get shared and it doesn't get liked, they don't bother writing another one. But if they print an article and it gets loads, then they'll write another one. And so, yeah, don't underestimate the power of getting on there and sharing these things, because it does influence what the press does. I never knew that. I do now. 
And so we kept on collecting evidence as well. We got all these things in the newspaper. We, we looked at all the hotspot data, and we found one company here, 98 fires in just nine days. And we got it into the international media. We had a petition where everybody signed it. An email went to the president, went to the ambassador from Norway, went to the governor of Aceh. Now, they didn't necessarily read these emails, but somebody in their office knows <laughs> these things are coming in. And that's when people start to pick up telephones. And that's when people say, hey, hey well, I'll do something about it. And then they, hey, go down to the field and investigate. And that's what happened. We had a special agency then called Satgas Red for reducing emissions in Indonesia. And they took that mandate and they went off to the field and investigated. And they came out and they found everything that we've been saying in the media was completely true. And they went back and they persuaded the Ministry of Environment to prosecute all of the companies in Twitter. And that resulted in the biggest fine ever handed out to any concession holder <coughs> anywhere in the country, $26 million. Now, remember that when we sat down and first challenged that company, we didn't think we could win that. And we ended up with this. We were blown away. You know, the power, what you can achieve when you're a few people with dedicate you get down to it and start working on something. But we got all these cases against all of the companies. Now, this is an old slide that needs updating. These things are all now finished as well. And they've all won. All of them have been won. They've all got prison terms and fines and everything else. Now the problem is that none of these fines have been paid and none of these guys have gone to prison. Until, like two weeks ago, we've got the first one in now. And we've, we've, all the NGOs up there are now focused on ticking these, ticking these fines and prison terms off one by one until we've got them all done. And there was an, even an article in The Guardian this morning about this very issue when this particular company was mentioned in that article. So we are actually making progress now. We've got the Guardian talking about the fact that these fines haven't been, haven't been paid and these guys haven't gone to prison. And we've finally got one. So it's been a very good couple of weeks for us. But while we were doing this, remember this is just in Tripper, which is one tiny part of the Loser ecosystem. We also have all the normal threats. You know, encroachment at the forest edge is always it's a constant problem. You know? People nibbling away. You always get that everywhere you go. But we've been fighting in the last few, few months against renewable energy. Now, I always thought renewable energy was good. And I thought it was great when the president said, right, we're going to switch from uh, non-sustainable fossil fuels to renewable energy sources. But I didn't think it was good when the first one they proposed was a geothermal plant right in the middle of the local ecosystem, in the middle of a national park, and in the middle of a World Heritage Center. Especially when this has a potential for 90 megawatts, and is miles away from the main population and industry zone, which is on the north coast up here somewhere. And there's another place up here which has a potential of 140 megawatts and is right next door. Why does the first one have to be the one here? Well, so you can build roads to it, of course, and then you can open it up and convert it to palm oil and everything else. It gets you access. Now, whereas we believe we've scuppered this one because the governor is on our side and he says he doesn't want this and he's going to get up the other one. But we're still hearing that the government has signed a contract with a Turkish company who still want to investigate all this. We're, we're not sort of relaxing yet. But we're also fighting hydroelectric schemes. I mean, major hydro dam up here in critical elephant habitat, another one here, and another one here in critical orangutan habitat. So we've been sort of looking at all the data on how many people live downstream. And there's a hell of a lot. And remember that this is one of the biggest, most active earthquake zones in the world. So we're talking to all the people who live downstream here and saying, hey, do you really want all this water piled up there? <laughs> That's one, one way of dealing with things. Yeah? But look at all these red lines as well. All these red lines are roads. And most of these things exist. They're of questionable legality. But we have a special plan that if it's allowed in Ache province, that's allowed to persist, we'll legalize all these roads. Whilst it doesn't persist, we still have an ability to challenge them on legal ground. So we're fighting in order to be able to try and challenge some of these. Now, I doubt we'll ever succeed in most of them, but we might get one or two scuppered. But roads are a major problem, yeah? Conservationists are now talking about roads as like cancer. You just put one in and you lose everything. But even if you don't chop down the forest left and right of the road, it's still a major barrier. Many songbird species that live in these forests will not even be found within 500 meters of a road let alone at the edge and flying across. They won't go near them. And orangutans also don't like crossing roads, and neither do many reptile species. And so just putting roads in here fragments populations from potentially viable ones to non-viable ones that are going to go extinct. 
if you have like 2,000 orangutans up here and you put all these roads in, then you end up 75 in here and 120 in there and 150 in there. These are all non viable populations that will go extinct. So roads are a constant nightmare, and I think many people underestimate the threat that they pose. But the bottom line in a place like the Los Rico system is we really do want to keep this place. It's the only place in the world where you've got rhinos, tigers, elephants, and orangutans living side by side. But it's also the only place in Sumatra where you really have the potential to conserve viable populations of these species. You do have elephants down south, and you do have tigers down south. But again, you're talking about eight over there, and six over there, and four over there. These are no longer really viable populations. Only up here in the north, in the Los Cerigo system in the far north, do you have this potential for long-term sustainable viable populations of these animals. Elephants is the blue up here. Now remember all those roads. There's loads of roads over there. We hear about elephant deaths in Aceh now on an almost weekly basis. Poisonings and killings and shootings or whatever. And I'm seriously concerned that in 15 years, there may not be any viable elephant populations left in Sumatra. I think this is a realistic possibility. The way things are going now, if we don't change it, that's what we will have. We may even be past the point where the elephants are still viable in Sumatra. Nobody really knows. The studies haven't been done in enough detail about genetic movements between populations. Rhinos, there's only a few a hundred or so left. Uh, so it's quite feasible that we may already be beyond hope with rhinos. Certainly, if roads go in there, you can expect them to be gone, effectively gone in as little as five years. And we may, in 15 years, have just a few hundred orangutans in this block here and a few dozen tigers. But we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. So I'm saying, I think, well, why? You know, why is all this destruction happening? You know, there must be a reason for it. And usually, the reason that we get is, oh, economic development, isn't it? You can, uh, Ian, you know, you can save your orangutan, you can save your this, uh, but you've got to have economic development as well, haven't you? That's what I was always feeling. But I'm starting to question this. I mean, Tripper is the Tripper Peak Swamps is a very good example. In a place like Trippie, you've got this big forest area, it's pretty much at sea level, maybe one or two meters above, maybe in some places already below. There's a few villages along the rivers, and they eat out a living, uh, catching fish in the swamps, that's their number one protein source. Uh, some of the people maybe claim to own bits of the forest because they have done for three generations, but there's no paperwork. So then you get a big company coming in with a concession permit from Jakarta. <coughs> The company may not be from the region, the owners may not be from the region, they may even be from London or Belgium or somewhere. Uh, the, 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 the owners of these companies probably never even going to go to the region. So they go in there with their paperwork, they have some people on the ground, they evict everybody who lives there off their land, go away, where's your paperwork? Then they bulldoze everything and then they torch it and kill every living thing. As they're doing that, they're releasing massive amounts of carbon. And then, in order to grow palm oil, you have to drain the water table to be about one meter below the surface <coughs> in order for the palm oil to grow. So you dig your canals and you lower the water table. Now that disrupts all the water supplies available for human communities and for their agriculture. It destroys the fishery stocks, which is the number one size, source of protein for people. The carbon then reacts with oxygen in the atmosphere, produces CO2, and releases millions of tons of carbon, which affects global warming. And then they grow palm oil for 25 years, and somebody gets really rich. Somebody who's already really rich, but probably lives somewhere else and has never been to the region. And then what happens is the actual surface goes down to 2.5 meters, on average, in 25 years, which is one cup of palm oil. So you go into an area, you evict everybody, destroy their water supplies and their fish stocks, you kill every living thing, you release millions of tons of carbon into the atmosphere, somebody who's never been to the area gets rich, and then at the end of it, you throw the whole thing into the sea. Now, I'm not seeing a strong economic argument here. I'm seeing the short-term greed, and the destruction of the economic potential of the region in the long term. It doesn't make economic sense to me. It, makes, it seems to me economic, sort of, shoot yourself in the foot. Now, we're also very used. Remember that slide at the beginning of how, sleep and un, uh, how steep and unforgiving the terrain is? You mess with these areas at your peril. Now, this is the village of Tamiang, or the town of Tamiang. After a couple of 
illegal guys, mafia guys, opened up one of the illegal areas of palm oil up in the hills there in protected forests. And then along down came the, the hill, the hillside and all the forest on it, and destroyed the entire town. Now this is not a rare event. There used to be. You know, these things happen naturally. In, in, in Bukit Lawang was a very famous case where there was no forest destruction upstream. It happened because every now and again you get these landslides and every 30 years or so you get particularly heavy rain and a couple of earthquakes. And a hundred of these landslides happen at the same time. It's a natural phenomenon. But once you mess with these areas, 30 year events become three year events. And not only do you lose your house and your car and school and the road and your wife and your kids and your grandma, you lose all your economic potential as well. These people are traditionally farmers, rice farmers. So they might grow a crop and then they make a bit of profit, they invest it in the crop next year, and then it gets trashed. And it happens <coughs> over and over and over again. So these guys are just trapped in poverty. Their economic potential in that area is destroyed because of the greed of some guys who've gone in the, into the hill. And it's not cheap, it's expensive, this stuff. It has major, major economic costs. So the World Bank studied those particular floods and concluded that in just 19 days in that region, cost that region's economy $210 million. It's expensive stuff. And I'm sat there thinking, who paid that bill? Is it the guys who caused it, or the people who were unable to afford to bear those kind of costs? Yeah, the lack of all this. And then I was reading this, another World Bank report, looking at the fires and the haze in Indonesia in 2015. Now, when the haze happens, you, know, you, you get like lots of cancelled planes, you get lots of cancelled business meetings, missed opportunities, you get massive losses to agriculture because plants don't see the sun for months on end, so your harvests are massively reduced. You have loads of people going into hospitals with sicknesses and illnesses and having to be treated. And they concluded that the fires cost Indonesia in 2015. Remember, the fires are mostly from the palm oil industry, also pulp and paper as well. But they reckon those fires and haze cost Indonesia $16 billion in that year. And then you compare that to the sort of annual revenues they get from palm oil. And it's half, or at best, like three quarters of that. Now, I always thought economics, you know, for something to be economically viable, you have to get more profit than your costs. <coughs> but this is telling me that the palm oil industry is not economically viable for Indonesia. It costs way more than it actually benefits. So I'm thinking, we need to look at this kind of stuff more. We need to look at these numbers. We need to ask these kind of questions. Because, you know, we don't, we've traditionally always said, oh, you've got to save the rent time because it's right. It's the right thing to do. And we've always been confronted with these economic arguments. I'm starting to think when we actually start looking into the economics and looking at the numbers, we don't need to do that. We can just look at the economics because the economics is on our side. And it struck me as well that this old argument that you can have uh, conservation or economic development, throw it in the bin because conservation and long-term sustainable economic development for the benefit of the majority are exactly the same thing. Conservation is not the same thing as trash your natural resources for quick profits and bugger off somewhere else. No, it's not the same as that, but that's business as usual. But conservation and long-term sustainable economic development are exactly the same thing. And then even more, I just put this in because it's interesting, but the new UN commissioned a report from, I always forget the name, TEB, the Environmental Economic Bureau or something, and they looked into global industries, and they thought, well, okay, You've got these industries making it economically viable. Once you factor in all these other costs that are traditionally borne by the state in terms of subsidies or borne by taxpayers or whatever, there's almost no industry in the world that's economically sustainable. So I'm thinking, you know, why, why do we always hit this argument? Conservation and economic development? Let's start in the bin. Let's start looking at the numbers. And he also obviously feels somewhat similar. So anyway, on a more optimistic note, and you'll be pleased to know we're getting towards the end of the talk, um, we've received 360 orangutans through the quarantine centre since 2001, more than that now. 270 have been released to the wild, 50, around 50 are at the quarantine at any one time. We've lost a few over the years, I'm very proud, about 20 over 17 years, very proud of that, and most of them were sick when they arrived, really sick. But we've accumulated six orangutans that we can never release to the wild. So what are we going to do with them? 
Now, we came up with this idea from this thing called the Orang Van Haven. And it started off as a small idea, it's grown into a bigger one. But I thought, well, these animals, they can live for 40, 50 years. And I don't want them living 40, 50 years in a metal cage like they're in now. And when I was at Jersey, we actually built these beautiful islands. And I thought, why can't we build something like that in Indonesia? And why can't we then get the people from Medan, who were the guys who signed documents that destroyed 10,000 hectares of forest at the other side of the island, face to face to learn and start to understand the problems a bit more. So we're pushing ahead with this. This is just a few of the animals. We've got six that can't be released. This is a good example. Loza, he's blind. He's shot 62 times, times with an air rifle. He's still got two pellets in one eye and one in the other. That's his x-ray. This is Dek Nong, a female who has a very chronic arthritic condition that we'll probably never solve. This is Chris Mon, who um, basically spent 19 years in this cage here. So when he came to us, he couldn't stand up. And he's <laughs> physically and psychologically traumatized. He's doing amazingly well now. He spends most of his time on the top shelf of the cage, climbs around like nobody's business. But he's, I don't think he's ever going to make that transition to, to be a wild around again. So I thought, yeah, why can't we build some nice islands like we built at Jersey and see if we can get these animals out there and give them a much better quality of life, but also use them to educate the public in Mega, which is 3.5 million people, you know, and the people who decide the fate of orangutan habitat. We looked for areas, an area where we thought there's a guaranteed water supply so we can build islands, the monks won't dry out. We found this beautiful valley here, which was formerly managed as fish ponds, so we decided we'd go for that. But it came a pack, in a package with 48 hectares, which is huge. Uh, it's mixed agroforest, so we've got oil palm, we've got rubber, we've got durian trees, we've got coconut groves, we've got orange groves. So the idea now is much bigger than it was when we first started. We want to develop the whole site as a kind of a sustainability uh, center, where all the agriculture is sustainable and organic, where the buildings and all the infrastructure is actually built out of sustainable alternative materials, alternative ways of doing things that the electricity generation is done with renew truly renewable resources in a sensible area. And get the people from Medan out there so that they can see there are other, other ways of doing it. So we've designed, designed nine islands. We've got six animals, but just joining these islands with a rope across is enough to give them access to two. We've started construction work. This is when I left a few weeks ago, so we're probably already excavating most of the islands now. Uh, we may have to do that again in six months because the rainy season has just started and we don't know what's going to happen. But it's, it's very much a process of learning by doing. We don't know anybody who's got expertise of building islands like this in that particular kind of uh, situation. We've developed, a, we've started working on eco-architecture. We've built this beautiful bamboo bridge now, which is quite stunning. And already attracting universities to come and learn these different techniques. Um, we're talking to the European Zoo Association about setting up some focused captive breeding programs for particularly threatened Asian songbirds uh, who are being devastated by the wild bird trade. So we expect to have 24 aviaries there, very much Jersey Zoo kind uh, programs. <coughs> and one of the things I want to use the Haven Forest to tackle the wildlife trade. <coughs> In that area, we have a lot of fruit bats being sold, like thousands every year. And the people who buy them are buying them and eating them, thinking they're going to be cured of asthma. They don't realize they're more likely to get Nipah virus and die, but that's the situation. But the people who buy them are not idiots. They're, they're, they're educated, middle class, often Chinese and above. But they've just never thought about the issue. They've never seen a fruit bat except in a cage at the side of the road. So the idea is that we will net over like 10 trees, have these fruit bats flying around, get people up there and say, you know, explain how, just how intelligent these animals are how complicated their social lives are, explain how people have radio track fruit bats in Malaysia and they fly across and they feed in Sumatra and fly back the next day. And I reckon we can get 50% of the people who would normally buy a fruit bat uh, to not buy them anymore. So our goal is to try and bring that trade down, demand for it by 50% over five years. And I think we can achieve that. Obviously, it's major potential for education. There's a lot of schools in Mena, many of which are already using the center to learn about agriculture and the environment. The potential for university students to get involved studying botany, soil science, climates, hydrology, unlimited really, so we want them to use the site as well. Um, we have uh, major, well, large areas are already being used to produce organic fruit and veg, and ironically, 60% of the diet of the orangutans in the nearby quarantine center are now organically produced fruit and veg from the haven. 
So they are probably getting the best quality fruit and veg in the entire North American region. And we're employing a lot of people and all these other opportunities. So I used to think about the Haven, and I thought, wow, it'd be great, you know, it'd be a unique education centre, but it would also be like a model for Indonesia zoos, which are terrible. And we'll be able to use it to try and push for raising standards in, in Indonesian zoos. <clears throat> and the more I talk about, the more I read about zoos generally, is that they get hammered all the time, because on the one side they're talking about education and conservation, but on the other side their shops are full of plastic bottles and their waste treatment is, is questionable and all these other things. And I think the Haven could be a model for zoos all over the place in, in terms of showing how they can be more holistic and take a much more sustainable approach to everything they do, not just their, their animals. So I really am almost finished. I've uh, just got a couple of things to point out. I remember I dedicated this to Gina. Taught me a lot about myself, a lot about orangutans. Uh, but we always thought about these animals have been ambassadors for their wild counterparts. Now I feel pangs of guilt sometimes when I think about Gina because the orangutans have never been more threatened than they are now. So what have we really <coughs> achieved in her lifetime? And I've learned this as well. When we sat down and decided we would take these companies to court, we didn't really think we could do it. And we, we knew that the key was media, and we knew that the key to media is massive international interest. And so we got out there and we pushed it. And I very much learned this. I thought it was a really good quote that people should always bear in mind. And we've been so successful that we even have people from Hollywood, Leo DiCaprio and Adrian Brody here, came down to the quarantine, and now they tweet and they, they share things about the Los Rico system. Ten years ago, nobody outside of North Sumatra had heard about the Los Rico system, except for a few people in the EU. Now, people in Hollywood know about it, and they're raising funds for it, and they're sharing and liking and telling stories about the Los Rico system. So we are achieving results. But the ultimate bottom line is this. And if there are any Americans in the audience, this is for you. <laughs> and of course it depends on the orangutans like uh, Messin here. The very first orangutan born in Janto and the pioneer uh, set laying new ground for a brand new population of the species. So with that I'll say thank you very much to the Durham Institute of Conservation Ecology <coughs> for helping us sort this out and the facility and the venue and everything. And thanks also to the Samaritan Rangtan Society for organizing all of the logistics and driving me down here and helping lay out all these things. So do make sure you have a look on here on the way out. And do make sure you pick up some leaflets about the Haven. And if you want to bid on anything, then uh, have a go and see if you want to know you like. With that, I'll say, I won't say thank you very much yet. I'll say, if you want to follow what we're doing and learn more and help, then we are quite active on social media, so get on there. We're always posting news updates, and occasionally we'll have particular campaigns to draw attention to particular issues. And it does help a lot if you get on there and you spread the word. So with that, I will finally shut up and say thank you very much to everybody. I don't see anybody asleep, but uh, I guess we're open for questions. <laughs> <laughs>